Welcome to the Ringer NFL Show. Sheil Kapadia here with my friends Deontay Lee and Steven Ruiz. Week 8 in the books. Good to have you watching on FanDuel TV or listening on Spotify. We're going to get to some big storylines, some big games some fun endings, uh, and then we'll plant our flags and hand out some awards as well. Deontay, how are we doing? I'm doing well, man. Obviously not in as sexy a studio setup as we were last Sunday when we were all able to come together and uh, review the games, but glad to be back home. I'm sure you guys all feel the same, and this was a a weird week of NFL football, maybe not as exciting as some of the other weeks that we've we've covered, but we had a lot of good matchups regardless. Ruiz, we got to fun ending to one game we got a little sunday night drama did it deliver for you yeah and that first slate that early slate scott hansen during the the witching hour that that was magnificent hansen totally rose to the moment and there i think there were six games in that first eight game window that were decided by five points or less and i think we got four game winning scores in the final minutes of games led by Jameis winston who we'll talk about later as expected, led by Jameis yeah. Winston, week eight, uh, an upset win over the Baltimore Ravens. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to some big matchups from Sunday. We're going to start with the Sunday night game, Cowboys 49ers. Looks like the 49ers are in full control. Cowboys come back, make it interesting in the fourth quarter, but San Francisco escapes with a 30-24 victory. My take from this game, and it might surprise, I don't know if it's going to surprise you guys or not, I think the Niners should feel really good about where they're at right now. You know, they they come into this game and they did a lot of the things we've talked about. Like, why are they making it so hard? Why aren't they doing the old Shanahan stuff? Well, in this game, 469 yards, just 4% of Brock Purdy's throws were into tight windows. This was Kyle Shanahan scheming it up, saying, even though I don't have everybody here, we're going to move the football. We're going to create explosives. And now they're in a situation where they're four and four going into their bye week probably potentially getting Christian McCaffrey back after the bye and no one's run away from the, in the NFC West right now. It's a three-way tie for first place at four and four. So for all the, you know, ups and downs, and it's been a roller coaster ride going back to the summer with this football team. And I've wondered 400 times on this, on this show, uh, if this is classic Super Bowl hangover season, Deontay, I think they got to be feeling pretty good about this. And they're in the mix of Super Bowl contenders in the NFC. I mean, this was the second shortest time to throw and tied for the lowest air yards per attempt for Brock Purdy so far this year. To me, I think that the story, if you're looking at San Francisco's offense, is Kyle Shanahan finally taking the keys back, right? Finally snatching the steering wheel back and starting to push some of those easy buttons again. You saw a lot more of those behind the line of scrimmage that were effective in this game. You saw a lot of slants, getting guys the ball on the move. Really, Debo Samuel and George Kittle, you know, I would say probably being the most obvious examples. And then I think we saw something from Gruendo that maybe they had a little bit more pop in the backfield than we may have thought um, or that Kyle Shanahan may have given Gruendo credit for um, as a backup running back. I think that this offense now has kind of found that it can change gears a little bit. And I I think you should feel really good about how well they look between the second and third quarter once they stopped hunting explosives um, as aggressively as they did to open the game. Yeah, we talked about their struggles against man coverage this season. They average 1.25 EPA per play on 10 plays against man coverage. They average 18 yards per drop back against man coverage in this game. So. I mean, it was one week only and they didn't score a touchdown outside of that third quarter where they win 21 to nothing and put the game away almost. Uh, but for one week only, they've solved their their biggest issue on offense so far. That's the issue that Kyle Shanahan was talking about uh, last week. And like she'll said, they kind of went back to their old tricks in order to solve it. And once they get all their guys back, it's easier to beat man coverage when you have Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel and George Kittle, who looked phenomenal today. Ricky Pearsall has started, you know, getting more reps. So I, I just feel like they're in a nice place, like you guys said, with different options. I, I don't know the exact way Kyle Shanahan wants to play because they've had some weird games that they, you know, just the style of play, the play calls, uh, their game plans going in through the first eight weeks of the season. But this felt like them getting back to their roots. And I think they're just going to be able to do that more uh, after their bye week. So 49ers in good shape. You know who's not in good shape? The Dallas Cowboys. Oh my goodness. They, you know, they come out like you mentioned, Ruiz third quarter it just looks like all right this game is a blowout they get a couple scoring drives in the fourth quarter and make it closer but they're now three and four on the season they're two games behind the eagles they're two and a half games behind the commanders ready for this in the nfc 
There are two teams with a worse point differential than the Dallas Cowboys, two, the Giants and the Panthers. That's not how we talk about the Cowboys generally in, in that conversation with the Giants and Panthers. So uh, I don't know, Ruiz, is this season, is it like over? Is it curtains or do you think there's hope? Are there solutions to the problems that, that ail this team or is this just not their year? No, I think it's over. I think it's over at this point. Uh, this is going to be a tough wild card race. You look at the three spots right now. It's Green Bay at six and two, Minnesota at five and two, and Philadelphia at five and two. Wow. Dallas isn't catching those teams, and like you said, they are not playing good football. It's not just like a misleading record. And we kind of talked about this on the Friday show. They also had problems against man coverage. They did not solve their problems against man coverage in this game. And obviously, the issues on the defensive side of the ball with Mike Zimmer's defense. They couldn't do the one thing that every other team has had success against this 49ers team. I think I said on Friday, this is the game where we kind of figure out if, if Zimmer is really cooked. And I would say right now, looking back on uh, the Sunday night game, this defense is cooked and the offense doesn't look much better. Yeah, they don't. I mean, defensively, it's just there's not a lot of talent. And like you said, Mike Zimmer has not shown that he's still a more with less coach. He was back in the day. I'll give him credit. Yeah. Those, you know, those Vikings teams, Mike Zimmer has put together a lot of great defenses in the NFL, but he doesn't have it right now. And offensively, Deontay, what are you, you know, D Dak Prescott? I mean, the numbers are, are terrible. He is right now 29th in drop back success rate. And so it's like you combine the way he's playing with the lack of talent, with the unimaginative scheme. Is this just what it's going to look like the rest of the year? I think so. Well, I would say I don't know if it's going to look as bad as it maybe has against the Steelers as it did against the Steelers at times and then throughout the game today against the 49ers. But this is a lot of what we talked about in the preview show is that these matchups have kind of played out pretty predictably for Dak Prescott against his defense because San Francisco is comfortable sitting in those two deep shells, not allowing them to get those manufactured deep shots to CD lamb and really forcing this offense to have to dink and dunk. And if there's one thing that this team has proven, and I don't know if it exists with every defense that Dak Prescott's faces, but for whatever reason, them forcing Dak to play that dink and dunk style of ball kind of forces him to take chances that I think are, uncharacteristic even as a guy who will put the ball in harm's way from time to time that deep throw that was picked off by that middle of the field safety like that's just an objectively bad ball and the same for the floated pass that got picked off up the sideline those are two passes that are just poor quality for any quarterback especially for one that we regard as highly as Dak Prescott but you can just see him pressing in these situations because it's so clear that he's not going to get any support from the run game outside of CeeDee Lamb there's nobody who can create before or after the catch whether it's separate or yards after the catch and I think that for him when you've got Nick Bosa bearing down on you and an offensive line that's not really creating any movement or giving you much comfort in the pocket it makes it really hard for you to play a plus style of ball and San Francisco I think just kind of has a bead on what Mike McCarthy likes to do offensively and they don't really allow this team to play with the kind of rhythm that they need to in order to be effective on that end of the ball yeah I mean it's it was a fragile build I think more than we gave it credit for last year like the tight window throws that Dak's throwing into this year, that was the case last year. He was just really good at it. And there is something off with him. I, I think Chris Collinsworth said it on the broadcast and you've seen it all season long. His accuracy wasn't, isn't what it once was when it was one of the better or more accurate arms in the NFL. Now he's missing those tight window throws and without them, this offense just isn't sustainable. The run game isn't there. The explosives in the run game aren't there. And outside of targets to CeeDee Lamb, the explosiveness in the pass game isn't there. And Mike McCarthy doesn't look like he has answers. Outside of last year, I mean, you could really go back a decade now or maybe like seven years where a McCarthy offense has really struggled to generate open looks for its quarterback. And we've seen two different styles of quarterback compete in this offense. We've seen Dak Prescott, who's way different from Aaron Rodgers, but they both have had the same issues finding open receivers in the scheme. What it, What is Jerry Jones uh, thinking when he hears, like you mentioned, because Chris Collinsworth was calling it out that his accuracy isn't what it was last year. He also said it's movement. You know, he said he just doesn't move the way he used to. And you just paid him, uh, you know, made him the highest paid player in the history of the NFL. Like, is this the start of a 
decline for Dak Prescott? Is this a, hey, blow it up and get a coach in there who knows what he's doing and he can look a lot better uh, next season? Because I, I heard the same thing from Collinsworth. It was kind of uncharacteristic, I thought, to hear that uh, on a broadcast. And I, I just wonder um, when Jerry Jones watches that back, or I don't think he has the earbuds in, you know, in the, uh, in the box there, but I'm sure those comments are going to get to him what he thinks when he hears that, Ruiz. I'm not sure I agree with the movement stuff. I think you've just okay. seen them go up against some tough pass rushes. This has been a, like a tough schedule of defenses they face. You, I, the 49ers, I know their defense hasn't like lit the world on fire, but we know with Bosa that pass rush can disrupt a quarterback. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, they played him two weeks ago before his injury, so the Lions rush was a lot better. The, the Steelers obviously have a good rush. The Ravens can get after the uh, after the quarterback as well. And we know the Browns can get after the quarterback, even though that was a, a bad game for Cleveland in week one. So I think it's just looked like he's moving a little slower in comparison to the pass rushes he's playing because he's playing fast pass rushes. But the accuracy point is definitely there. He's not hitting the throws he was hitting last year. And that was the lifeblood of this offense. And it's not there anymore. So the offense is dying. And by the way, someone remind Jerry Jones that when Dak Prescott is throwing a go ball to Gavante Turpin, with the game on the line that you could have done some stuff in the off season, yeah. Jerry. I know, I know you re-signed uh, CD and you re-signed Dak and oh, everything was fine. And you're an entertainment product. Uh, you had moves you could have made if you would have been wiser with your spending, with your salary cap flexibility, where that's not what this game is coming down to partially in the fourth quarter. So it's a mess there. This season's going just about as bad uh, as you could expect. It is a long season. You get Micah Parsons back maybe here uh, in a couple weeks and, and they can be, I think a competitive team or some pro surprise prize some teams in the second half of the season, but it's hard to get to the point where you view them as a real contender there in the NFC. All right, let's take a break. We come back. We get to the most exciting ending of the day. Maybe the most exciting ending of the season. I'll have to think about that, but it's certainly up there when we come back. Back on the Ringer NFL show, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels. Some parts of the game were a little boring, and then in the fourth quarter, all of a sudden, uh, it explodes. And I'll tell you what I was thinking, Ruiz. Let's thank the football guys that Daniel Snyder doesn't get to enjoy uh, the Jaden Daniels experience. You know that is uh, that is a win for all of us that he is no longer the owner of the team as they're entering this new era. But uh, I don't know you, your takeaways. You can go in a number of different directions with this game. Uh, what stood out to you? I think it was the the loss that the. Chicago coaching staff has to take for this. I, I feel like they have to wear this loss more than anybody. I know Tyreek Stevenson did not have the best end of game situational awareness. I think he was celebrating or taunting the fans uh, while the ball was being snapped for the uh, Hail Mary. And then it seemed like Noah Brown was his guy and he kind of left him to go try to uh, get an interception or bat the ball down. If he was trying to bat the ball down, it did not work. It ended up ricocheting right to and wide open Noah Brown, but still that, I don't think that play should have mattered. I, I feel like this Bears team, whether it's Shane Waldron calling the the handoff to the backup center, oh my God. and getting very very predictable results. Like if you had asked me, like what's the worst that can happen? We're going to hand it off to our backup center in a key situation down near the goal line with the game on the line. I would go ah, maybe a fumbled handoff, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> it, it didn't even seem like they were close to handing the ball off correctly. I don't know. It didn't look like they had practiced this play before. It was very bad. It was a, a, a red flag for me for the entire coaching staff, as was the failure to bat the ball down, the failure to have a guy on Noah Brown. So he wasn't just standing there wide open in case the ball bounces to him. And then I think you could argue with some other decisions that were, that had less stakes. Like in the first half, I think he could have challenged a, a third and one play. They don't challenge the spot. It was an iffy spot. I don't know if they would have gotten it, but it would have at least given them time to discuss the fourth down play call. They didn't end up doing that. They end up forcing a bubble screen to DJ Moore that gets just blown up behind the line of scrimmage and they turn the ball over there. There were some other issues too. I, I thought Shane Waldron was a little bit too cute with his play calling. If you just ignore the, the bad handoff to the backup center. Even outside of that, there were some short yardage play calls that I, I didn't agree with. So I would start there. But if I'm a Bears fan, as bad as this loss was to stomach, what Caleb Williams showed in the fourth quarter 
and how he was impressing Tony Romo in the booth. Tony Romo was oohing and on in the booth all, all uh, fourth quarter long. I think you have to be happy because that was not a good start to a game, and he did not. He was not deterred by that, and he played his best football in crunch time against a Washington defense that I thought played really well and put him under pressure constantly. What would you think, Deontay? I think – I think if we're looking at it from a big picture perspective, I think there were so many things that came up um, in this game that were a microcosm of both these rookie quarterback seasons, right? Like you saw a lot of what Cliff Kingsbury is able to do to help Jaden Daniels with bubble screens, with RPOs and guys creating after the catch. And then on the flip side of that, and this is something that I know I've talked about, and it sounds like nitpicking when they're putting up 35, 38, 40 points in a given week. But I think what you saw from Chicago's defense in response was, a commitment to playing tight coverage on basically all downs and really forcing Jaden Daniels to have to deal with discomfort in the pocket. You know, I thought they were very smart with their pass rush discipline in the second half specifically, really making that really making him have to work around a late fifth rusher or not just running out of the back door of the pocket and allowing him to, to, um, to escape quickly um, to, to uh, extend plays and push the ball down the field. And then on the other side, you look at Caleb Williams, and I think that Steven kind of hit the nail on the head. You can maybe count like on two or three fingers the amount of times where you look at a play call and say, wow, Shane Walter just made it really easy on his rookie quarterback, right? Even in a play action bootleg game in, um, you know, in the drop back game, trying to work the middle of the field or trying to find easy one on ones. There are so many situations throughout the game where you just kind of leave it disappointed. And Caleb definitely kind of shares in his responsibility with that as well. He made some plays worse, especially in the first half, bailing out of pockets, you know, trying to do too much. I think that we're seeing um, all the ways in which being an improviser for him can be harmful within the structure of this offense. But I don't know if he's being helped on the other side of that. Either. Um, and that's like not even interfacing with some of the worst play calls of the day. Obviously, you have the fumbled handoff. You have the horrible execution in, Hail Mary, in a Hail Mary situation. Like I, my blood is boiling for so many reasons well, <laughs> from this game, from Chicago's perspective. But I think if you're both teams, you should feel good. Um, obviously, Washington, not only do you get the win, but I think you saw a really tough kind of gritty performance from your quarterback dealing with the rib injury. And like Steven said, from Caleb Williams, you saw a great fourth quarter. You started handling the pressure much better, really delivering the ball in tight coverage and anticipating guys coming open. Um, but yeah, I think that it's weird to walk away from a game feeling like Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury are clearly the better coaches on the sidelines, but that's how it felt, If I think, if you're evaluating what we saw on Sunday. I, I really hated the, the decision to only rush three after Daniels on the Hail Mary. It's easy to say this in hindsight. And then not only just rush three, but they also have a spy. I didn't quite understand the reason to have a spy when obviously Daniels isn't going to scramble for 50 yards. I get, you don't want him to hold on to the ball, but the spy didn't really uh, stop that from happening. He held on to the, the ball before throwing it 12 seconds. It was the longest Hail Mary in recorded history, according to next gen stats since 2016. That's how far their numbers go back. So whatever the strategy was, it didn't really work. And you gave him so much time and you gave the receiver so much time to get down there. I always prefer a, a, an all out blitz on a Hail Mary. Give me one of those. I like how Todd Bowles does it. That's what Todd Bowles would do. Jim Schwartz. Jim Schwartz Jim also Schwartz is a too. fan of the Blitz. Listen, I agree with what you guys are saying about the, uh, I mean, Shane Waldron, it was comical. Honestly, put him back on fraud watch. That, w that was pathetic. I, You know, one thing, like you always need your friends to look out for you. Like if you're going to wear a weird shirt or something and like they make fun of you and then you don't do it because you're like, all right, I need other opinions. Who are the friends who should have been making fun of Shane Waldron in practice on Wednesday when you're trying to install that play into the game, a handoff to a backup offensive lineman when you're on the one yard line? Like, how does that? And they have a great short yardage back. Process? Roshan yeah. Johnson is a great short yardage back. They've been very successful in goal line situations, handing the ball off to the actual running back. I don't understand why you would get cute there. You're also making the run play a 10 on 11 run play because you don't have that extra blocker you're wasting with the back behind the fullback in the eye. Like it, it just when you go through the layers of this decision, what had to happen to get to this point, it's mind boggling that an NFL team could do this. And maybe if, if he does score, we're probably celebrating this, but I don't know. I, I think the process was bad. It wasn't sound process. Like, uh, who was looking at the game plan? It was like, you know what this needs more of? David Kramer Jr. We need to get him some touches. That's what I'm saying. You need, you need a coach. The hell no, we're not doing that, coach. Once a week, yep. veto power. 
If someone suggests something stupid, the hell no, we're not doing that. Coach can say, we're not, nope, we're not doing that. As soon as that gets introduced, we're not doing that. What's your, what's your second best option? And that would fix all of this. They need that on the bear. So I, I agree with you guys I, there. I blame the lions for this. They, they, they're the no, only ones they that do can it, pull it's off beautiful. these. No, 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 no. No, I'm work, saying. If it works, it's fun. They're setting an unrealistic <laughs> standard for the rest of these teams. All these other teams don't have Panay yeah. Sewell. He should be the only, him and Trent Williams should be the only offensive lineman that get to be on the receiving end of, of trick plays or whatever you want to call them. I don't know what to call that. The only person they tricked with, no. was Matrix themselves. himself. Yeah, they <laughs> tricked themselves uh, on that one. I agree with that. I agree that Caleb Williams finished strong. He was terrible for three quarters in this game. Yeah. I mean, was he awful. was so jittery and uncomfortable and inaccurate and spinning around and his pocket presence uh, was terrible in this game. He finishes 10 for 24 for 131 yards. But the biggest story of this game is that Jaden Daniels added another chapter to his legend. I mean, he's through week eight now and he throws a game winning Hail Mary after playing with a rib injury where I didn't think he was even going to play in this game. He throws for 326 yards. He runs for 52 yards. They have 481 yards of offense against a very good uh, Chicago Bears defense. And if you're a Washington fan, you're just like, Sundays are amazing this year. Every game, I mean, I remember that Monday night game. He's just like adding stuff week after week after week. Uh, and he looks comfortable. He just looks very comfortable back there operating the offense. Romo was calling that out, going through his progressions, knowing knowing where his answers are. Uh, and I like his instincts too. Like he has the Mahomes thing where he runs near the sideline. Now, sometimes he takes a big hit, but he kind of knows right where the first down marker is and when he needs to get out of bounds. So uh, even when it's a little rocky at times for him, like I thought they were very close to blowing the Bears out in this game. I mean, you had the Zach Ertz touchdown that he couldn't come down with. You had another touchdown called back uh, because of a penalty. So the final points, I feel like, uh, and the Hail Mary don't reflect just how well they played. So commanders are 6-2 and two and in first place in the NFC East. They would be the two seed in the NFC if the season ended today. And to your point, uh, Ruiz, I mean, their, their defense has played a lot better here in the last two or three weeks. So um, I'm with you. If, if you're a Bears fan, there was a scenario where you're like, oh, man, Caleb Williams didn't show up. You know, he looks terrible in this game against Jaden Daniels. He finished strong until they took the ball out of his hands and tried to hand it to the backup lineman there. All right, we'll take a break. We come back, and we're going to talk about who had the worst Sunday. Back on the Ringer NFL show. All right, we're back here. Who had the worst Sunday? Let's sprinkle in a little negativity. Who do we want to laugh at? Who do we want to make fun of? Ruiz, lead us off. Who do you got? I'm going to go with the team that lost to Jacoby Brissett, who had to replace Drake May after he took a helmet-to-helmet shot. I think what makes this game worse from a Jets perspective is the fact that they played really well on offense. Like, they played one of their more complete games on offense in terms of EPA, in terms of success rate. They outgained the Patriots by two yards per play. They had the higher EPA, the higher success rate. They had a positive EPA in both the ground game and the pass game. So... The firing of Robert Sala clearly hasn't worked. They've given up 62 points to Russell Wilson and Jacoby Reset over the last two games. The defense has been the reason they've lost these games. But the move away from Nathaniel Hackett has yielded the results that they wanted when they made the shift. And they've really leaned into the Aaron Rodgers aspects of the offense. They have a 91% shotgun rate since uh, the firing. So for the last three weeks, they are third in, no, no, they are fourth in explosive play rate. They are 10th in EPA per play since then. So the offense has kind of turned around, but now the defense is the problem. And we're at the point, what are they, two and five now? We're at the point where it's too late. They are two and six now. They are, we're at the point where it's too late. Even if this offense does rebound, even if it does play like a top 10 offense, which I think is it's ceiling. I don't think it's going to be any better than that. I don't think they're going to be able to make up enough ground in the AFC East. I don't think they're going to be able to make enough ground in the wild card uh, race. And there's still a tremendous amount of pressure on a quarterback on the wrong side of 40 who's coming off a major Achilles injury. The defense can't get better. I don't know how the defense is going to get better. The secondary has regressed. The pass rush has been 
a question mark all season long. It hasn't gotten any better over the last couple of weeks since Salah's firing. So I I don't know where this team goes from here. I, I mean, I guess they can hang a banner for, hey, we might finish with a top 10 offense over the second half of the season. We finally figured out the Aaron Rodgers offense, but that's as much as they're going to get this season. I mean, Woody Johnson has egg on his face here. I mean, just look at his comments when he, and again, I'm not like Robert Sala with Vince Lombardi and you, how dare you fire him? I understand firing Robert Sala, but look at what Woody Johnson said at the time, that this team is too talented and we cannot reach our potential with Robert Sala, so we are going to a new coach. You have since lost three games in a row. They have not won a game since that firing. And to your point, Ruiz, the defense has taken a step back, in my opinion, which was predictable because not only are you losing Robert Sala, but you're taking the defensive coordinator and Jeff Albrick and making him the head coach. And now he's got to manage stuff and he didn't do a great job managing stuff uh, today either. There was some Aaron Rodgers yelling at the sideline here today. So yeah, it feels like didn't they burn all some... three timeouts like early oh, yeah. in the first half. As oh well? yeah. That was one of my favorite uh, graphics of the day. Let me see here. Yes. There was a graphic that came up on the broadcast that said jets, three timeouts, four penalties, one missed extra point. With 13.45 left in the second quarter, this is what they had. I mean, They also took a delay of game before the two-point conversion that would have stretched yes. them to seven, and that set up the game-winning drive. And then they also had the most cowardly fourth-and-one decision of the week, I would say. Yes. It was fourth and less than a yard from the 10-yard line or, or the 11-yard line, and they go for a 29-yard field goal instead of trying to punch it in for six. I just I don't get it. When you're a team that's so desperate and you need – you need these explosive plays. You need these. The, uh, I don't want to bring up the momentum thing from this past week, but I do think you need those moments to turn the season around. They're just not getting them. They're not even trying for them. Yeah, they've lost five in a row, Deontay. Uh, and and this, I mean, I don't two and six. It, it's it feels over, right? I mean, seven. Where yeah. are they going to go? Eight and one, seven and two. They're not good enough to do that. And they've lost to, They've lost games that they have no business losing. You can't lose games like this. You can't lose a Broncos game. You have burnt up all, all of the margin for error. You burnt up basically before you even fired your head coach in the first place. And then you went and doubled down and try to bring in a, a high level receiver. And I will say to Steven's point, this is the most comfortable. I think we've seen Aaron Rodgers look at the, at, at in New York up to this point, we saw him pushing the ball down the field much more effectively. Okay. Some of the accuracy issues that we had seen over the last two to three weeks, we really didn't see today. I thought that he worked the middle of the field. Well, he took his chances up the scene pretty well when those presented themselves too. and the running game looked a little bit more stable and healthy than it had in, in weeks prior. And I think that maybe the mark of an unserious team is one that just cannot play complimentary football to save its life. And that has been the story for these three weeks and these three losses in a row is something has gone wrong um, for this team, whether it's the defense giving up big plays. You know, that's basically been the story for the last couple of weeks now. Um, this coverage unit has been banged up. And even if they even when they were healthy, you could start to see some of the signs of slippage. Losing games like this just makes it clear that, like you said, Woody Johnson has 100% misunderstood what this team needed in order to be its best. That's not to say that Robert Sala would have been um, undefeated over this stretch that they've been losing all these games, but they've clearly done nothing but take a step back defensively, and that was supposed to be the bedrock of this team, and all they really needed Aaron Rodgers to do was be a ceiling raiser, and now what we're looking at is a 40-plus-year-old quarterback coming off an Achilles that has to be a superhero. And that's never been that's never been a recipe for success. It's been five weeks since this team beat New England, the team that played on Sunday by 21 points. It, it looks like a worse team. It looks like a far worse football team. That no team doubt. was two and one at the time. Now they're yeah. two and six. And the issues go beyond even the defense and the offense. The special teams really let them down today. I mean, you could add in the two point play, the uh, delay of game into the special teams. But also Greg Zerline misses a 44-yard field goal. He misses an extra point. Those points proved costly in a game that ended up being decided by three points. Yeah, they're one and four and one score games. It's interesting to think about in the offseason, if they would have just switched the offensive coordinator and been able to come up with some resolution there and started the season with someone other than Nathaniel Hackett, what does this look like? I don't know. Maybe they win a couple of those games and we're not saying their season is cooked. They're, again, they're not getting blown out. It's not like they're a disaster, but uh, my goodness, two and six is too deep of a hole to dig out of. Uh, Deontay, what do you got? Who who had the worst Sunday in your opinion? 
I would say, I mean, if we're being objective, I think the Titans had the worst Sunday. But if you <laughs> if you want to talk about the team that had maybe the most disappointing um, output okay. on Sunday, I would say it's Baltimore, especially on the defensive end. I'm as a defensive coordinator, I 100 percent believe in like dropped interception karma. I think when you drop picks, you are just inviting the worst possible plays to happen after the fact, just emotionally. And again, not bringing up momentum, but I do think that there is something to deflating a team. You obviously saw the Kyle Hamilton, like three opportunities at securing the same interception. And he drops that that would have ended the game. And then they go with the zero blitz and Eddie Jackson got burnt. This was probably Eddie Jackson's worst game of his NFL career. I would say like there were issues with him and coverage throughout the day. Um, but to me, this is something that I've kind of tried to dance around, maybe waiting for a better result to kind of show me what things could be on the other side. But we have now looked at two consecutive months of this team just playing very poor football and coverage, especially in the middle of the field. Right now, Baltimore is last in defensive EPA on passes thrown between the numbers, and they have the second highest explosive play rate allowed on those throws. You Ooh. can't win. You can't win a championship that way. And this is not a team that's had a lot of turnover in its back seven, right? Like, obviously, you lose your Davian Clowney. And I do think there maybe is a little bit of an argument to them needing a little bit of extra help with their pass rush. You do see the pressure numbers look okay. But if you're watching on a down to down basis, I don't know how many high quality pass rush reps they get off the edge. Usually it's either Matabike killing somebody on the interior or you get a Travis Jones kind of pocket push. Um but to me, I think that what you're seeing is a team that has really invested all of its energy in loading up the spine of this defense to stop the run. And when they're doing that, there's nobody better in the league. When you look at the combination of Trent Simpson, Roquan Smith, and Kyle Hamilton, when they're in nickel, all playing close to the line of scrimmage, blowing up the run game, that looks great. I think that it has come at the cost of them giving up some easy throwing windows, easier throwing windows in the middle of the field. And when you add the missed opportunities in terms of drop picks and not getting off the field on third downs, I think even when they've blitzed, they've had problems getting off the field and getting pressure on quarterbacks. It has just been like a categorical failure in a lot of ways for Zach Orr. And that's not to say he's a bad play caller because you can look at their splits and see, OK, they're playing too high. They're playing too high shells. They're giving zone coverage looks. I think they're playing man coverage in situations that call for it. They're just losing. You know, and, and when you're looking at an offense that's starting as backup quarterback in Jameis Winston and is fresh off of trading Amari Cooper, who was their number one receiver, be able to have the kind of ease that the Browns did in the passing game. It's hard to me to see how many other contenders that lost had a worse put output than, than Baltimore's defense did on Sunday. Yeah, it, it wasn't a bad game from Lamar Jackson. Usually when this team loses, it's because Lamar Jackson is off, but he Averaged over seven yards per drop back in this game, had a success rate over 50%, averaged 0.1 EPA per play. Like those are very solid numbers. Those are Pro Bowl level numbers. But I don't know how many times I've looked up this season that I've seen a wide receiver just running wide open in Baltimore's defensive secondary. It's happened too many times. And we're in week eight now. Like that was understandable or, or more understandable in the first month of the season. You have a first year defensive coordinator, you're trying to install not you have a different guy in the headset calling the plays i think that does matter but i think we're starting to see that where they're missing mike mcdonald the most is that solidarity in the secondary this team isn't passing off routes like it used to we're seeing way more mistakes we're seeing guys run into each other in coverage and uh free receivers wide open it's like the polar opposite of what we saw from this defense last year when it was the best defense in the nfl especially that stat in between the numbers, defending the pass, that was their thing, was taking away the middle of the field, and they just can't do it right now. Yeah, they're five and three. You you mentioned it. The Browns had 22 first downs, 401 yards of offense, both season highs. Ravens did have some injuries at corner uh, in this yep. game. And uh, the per the athletic, Marcus Williams was benched, did not uh, start this game, was a, uh, quote, personnel decision, according to John Harbaugh, that they want to keep internal. So some Weird stuff maybe happening uh, with the personnel there in the secondary. What a weird season. The Ravens have, for much of the season so far, looked like the best team in the NFL, but now they have losses to the Raiders and the Browns uh, on their ledger here. So they have not lost a game by more than a touchdown. I still think they're obviously among the best teams in the NFL. However, you start looking at like playoff seeding and you know how, how what's your path going to look like to get to a Super Bowl, and now you're five and three, whereas a team like the Kansas City Chiefs uh, is seven and zero. Oh. So yeah, you don't want to lose those those games to inferior 
opponents are. If I'm being objective too, I mean, the Jets had the worst weekend. You, again, it, Ruiz said, you give it up a 70 yard uh, drive to Jacoby Brissett with the game on the line and like no margin for error in your season. That's the worst. Uh, <laughs> worst uh, lo- w- w- what was our phrasing? Worst loss of the week? Tell yeah, me. Who had the worst Sunday? Worst, worst Sunday. Worst there are a lot of candidates on there. There are a lot of candidates. go with um and i actually don't think he did have the worst but he's on the list anthony richardson uh for this he was 10 for 32 for 175 yards and five sacks and key key moment in this game end of the first half colts have the ball at their own five yard line with a minute left the game's tied 10 10 second down anthony richardson nearly gets picked Third down, they put the ball back in his hands. He does get picked this time. Texans score a touchdown. They go up uh, 17-10. And this one went back and forth. The Texans were trying to give this game away. Uh, you know, they they had a, a fumble late in the game where the Colts have one final uh, attempt to be able to drive and kick a field goal, and they're not able to do anything with it uh, there. And so the Texans hold on for the victory. But there was more. I don't know if you guys saw this aspect of it, and I really don't know what to make of it, so I I want your take. But this is per Stephen Holder of ESPN. In the third quarter, Richardson took himself out of the game because he was tired. Uh, Third and goal from the 23. Joe Flacco comes in, hands the ball off. I'm legitimately not trying to be a jerk. Like I, I fatigue very easily. Like if I had to play, I would be coming out all the time. I just don't remember ever hearing a quarterback taking himself out of the game uh, because he was tired. Ruiz, how much do we make of this? This is being overblown. If you okay. saw the play, you could, okay. you would understand why he needed to come out of the game. He had to throw like a 300 pound man off of his back with just his upper body at one point. And then he ran like another 50 yards, not like total. Like I think when he ran around, if you count for his path. Okay. I mean, it was third and 23. They weren't going to score anyway. They gave up anyway with the surrender play call. I don't have any problem with it. Anyone complaining about it is just, I don't think they were paying attention to the game and what happened before he took himself out. It was the smartest play for him at the time. I will say that play was that play was defensible to me for the reasons that Steven laid out. I also think that we really only care about it because of the way the box score looks. If he had 300 yards in two touchdowns with no picks and was running around and you had that play and he needed a breather, I think that people would be a little bit more sympathetic towards that. Um, but to your point, Sheila, I think I looked up, I, I had it on my multi-view. I think I like flashed my eyes in, in that corner of the screen at some point in the first half. And he was like two of 13 for like 83 yards or something like that because he had the early the early big touchdown to Josh Downs right. um, in this game. But you just see it, and this is something that I, I've really been I've been noting, and it's been honestly getting worse on a week by week basis. But some of these bad misses that you're seeing on early downs when he's still operating within the structure, when the pockets are clean, it would be one thing if he was playing CJ Stroud ball where there's always a body in his face and he's got to sidestep somebody or he's got to work an awkward arm angle to try to get the ball into a tight window. That's not always the case for Anthony Richardson. A lot of this is just off his back foot, standing tall in the pockets, got a good throwing lane, and the ball is just sailing right and landing with the cameraman out on the on the outer edges of the sideline and that's just not to me it's just inexcusable to me for the kind of quarterback that we've talked we've been talking about i want to be optimistic but i do think for now we kind of have to separate any comparisons to josh allen any comparisons to cam newton some of these other big bodied uh, very athletic quarterbacks because I don't think that any of them really had this kind of prolonged accuracy issue outside of Josh Allen early in his career. And I think that for at that point in time, if we were going to be honest about Josh Allen, then it looked like a non-viable quarterback. So maybe something radical happens to change his accuracy. But as it stands right now, that accuracy is 100 percent the reason why Indianapolis is not at the top of the AFC South, because they've had a lot of opportunities to, to stack up wins that they haven't had an opportunity to either because Richardson has been hurt or when he's been in the game. We've seen issues with him in the passing. In the passing I, I do think on Sunday, though, the completion percentage thing was a little misleading, like he 
they had like five to seven drops in this game. He was under pressure. You, you said it, he's had accuracy issues in a clean pocket, which I do agree with. But today it was like he was playing like CJ Stroud. He was pressured on over 45% of his dropbacks. Combine that with the drops and a, a dot of over 15, which he controls, to be fair. He's the one that decides to throw the ball downfield all game long. But it makes more sense that he completed only, what was it, 31% of his passes. I mean, I think you saw in this game, especially in the second half, he averaged 0.15 EPA per drop back in the second half. So he was a much better player. He also ran for 35 yards. He had four runs of over 10 yards in this game. You could see why Shane Steichen is sticking with him. And like the accuracy is obviously an issue. The misses are very, very ugly. I don't think we saw too many of them in this game, actually. I thought he was under duress, and I thought it was understandable that he incomplete as, at, I don't know, two-thirds of his passes. But we have seen other quarterbacks go through this. You mentioned Josh Allen. Josh Allen was completing only 65% of his checkdowns, just checkdowns over the first two years of his career. So he did have accuracy issues on par with this. It wasn't that bad because they weren't asking him to throw 18 yards downfield all the time. Right. right. Uh, I, I mean, I, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. I'm, I'm not selling my stock yet. I'm thinking about selling it, but it doesn't look good right now. But I do think this performance in a vacuum was a little more understandable compared to the ugly ones we've seen out of him from the past couple of weeks. I am coping, though. I, I will admit that freely. I was going to say, he, he threw 22 uh, incompletions. Some of them, had, there had to be a good percentage of them uh, that were bad. But I, I think it is interesting, the the types of throws he's attempting. Like you mentioned, sort of how far they go downfield. 41% of his throws today were into tight windows. Again, that was 4% for Brock Purdy. So is this like, I, I don't know, is it just his decision making? Is it, can they do stuff? You know, Shane Steichen, and everyone was putting him in the Hall of Fame before the season started. Can you get through to your, like, can we, can we get some more layups uh, for the quarterback? Or can we get through to him to, hey, you don't need to be chucking it that far downfield on every single attempt here. I mean, right now he's completing 44% of his passes uh, on the season since 2000. There's been 826 quarterbacks. He ranks 800, 823rd in completion percentage ahead of Achille Smith, Josh Freeman, and Derek Anderson. Oh, and that's gosh. on the season. It's just that when the ball's hitting the ground that much, it doesn't matter if you're throwing, you know, 550-yard passes uh, exactly. every game. It, it's just going to be impossible to sustain here. I'm still – Let's let's see more. It's a, like like again, rookie. He's not a rookie, but he's he's theoretically, uh, or as I look at him, he is a rookie. Given how little football, he's only twenty two, still yeah. the youngest starting quarterback in the NFL. Right, he hasn't didn't play a lot in college. Yet. Looks yeah. like it. Looks, yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> looks, looks like it. Looks like it. So we'll see what it does. But it was not a good Sunday for Anthony Richardson. All right, we take a break. We come back and we plant our flag. I think Justin Herbert is a top five MVP candidate this year. I know the county numbers aren't there, but when you watch this guy play, we all watched on Monday what he did with that no name receiving core and tried to drag the Chargers to a win against the Cardinals, despite Greg Roman trying his best to lose that game for them. But this game uh, uh, on Sunday, he averaged over eight yards per drop back while having 75% of his attempts come on third downs or obvious passing situations, which I think is second and long and third and more than medium. And he's, he's just not making mistakes in this offense. I know there aren't a, a ton of high level explosive passing plays, but he, the ones they do get are almost all based on his talent and his otherworldly ability to throw a football and to do it while under pressure He's only being sacked on 7% of his dropbacks. If you've watched that offensive line, it's one of the worst offensive lines in the league in terms of pass protection this year. It seems like every time he drops back, it's immediate pressure in his face and he has to ward off a, a unblocked pass rusher to get a pass off, just, just to get a check down off. And then today he had, you know, the Chargers get their one explosive run to pad the numbers every week. It, this time it was Justin Herbert. He finally chipped in with one. He had like a 50 yard uh, run where he just outran the entire defense. So I'm going to say, Justin Herbert, I don't know if it ends like this, but right now, if I was filling out an MVP ballot, he would be fifth on my list. Deontay, I I'm speechless. Do you, you want to take <laughs> a fun or do I need? They're four top, and three. Uh, top, 
Flacco this five. Time. Listen, there's an argument that he's playing better than the numbers are showing, and I understand what you're saying. Top five MVP candidate is crazy. They're not in the top half of the league in any offensive category. How can you be a, like if you replaced him with somebody else? I mean, there's only so far they can fall here. They, are, was, they have a playoff spot right now. The, if the playoffs start, they have today, a playoff spot be because the their playoffs. defense gives up like eight points a game. Their defense hasn't given up more than twenty points in any game this season. I mean, again, I don't. I'm not. I, I know you're saying the stats don't tell everything, but I mean, he he's t- below twenty in success rate in EPA per play. Their offense uh, passing DVOA ranks seventeenth. They're not even sniffing the top ten in any of this. And I'm not blaming him. This league isn't average just, is, is amazing to me. League average pass game with this with a great Roman calling the plays in this receiving core where where they miss quentin johnson like that they, they they can't survive without quentin johnson is uh that's an amazing feat wait, wait like where's the bar i think we have to adjust for expectations do we not okay but there are other quarterbacks doing more who are who are not in like name them in great situations name i them. mean i don't know did josh allen have the best supporting cast until he got amari cooper well, he did get Amari Cooper. We're, we just okay, but that was the last two weeks. Celebrating his supporting cast. Yeah, he had three cap, but even before that, I mean, he, if you would have gone through the first, that was two a week ago. And so Josh Allen's one of the people first. on the list. Okay, let me let me name my my MVP candidates. Okay, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, Josh Allen. Yeah, I'll just throw Jaden Daniels in there to get to get on your good side. Yeah, I mean, he, he kind of has to be at this. Yeah, yeah, he, has to, yeah, he has to be at this point. And then I don't know where to go next. Where do you go next? You're forgetting one certain player, I would say, whose team is undefeated. Mahomes? Yeah. Come on. If you switch Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes right now, you're telling me that the Chiefs are 7-0 and and that the Chargers are worse than 4-3. and That's crazy. I think you have the same record. Uh, to, no. What? Seriously? Yeah, 100%. No, I'm, I'm just, just like, <laughs> this is great for me because as Steven was just like spelling out this take, I think Sheila and I were doing the exact same thing. I saw you kind of lean back and look at Wait. the other monitor. I had the same thought. I was like, oh, I, I like to let Steven cook when, when he's got to take like this. But I was like, all right, let me look at this box score and pull up true media really quick because there's just no way that this take can stand. And I'm, I'm actually with Sheila. Yeah, we're just looking one. at box scores. Let's watch the games. How about we watch well, the games? Uh, I will say, like, over the last two weeks, the thing that I've liked about the Chargers offense is that they are putting more of the game in Herbert's hands. Yeah. That part I do enjoy, and you're seeing the fruits of that labor, fruits of those labors um, in the passing game, especially in the first half of games where they're getting him his volume in terms of dropbacks and allowing him to use that quick passing game. It's funny because it's clearly being done just to loosen up the box a little bit so they can come back to the run game later. I think that's a lot of the fullback targets, tight end targets. Sure. There's, a, there's a lot of check downs. I think just try to make, just try to capture linebackers eyes. But I do think Justin Herbert has been playing well. And I think the better framing for this argument might be there's a short list of quarterbacks that can step into this situation and even get this offense to be, 20th 20 20th to 22nd in success rate in epa in the passing game but he's not a top five mvp candidate right now it's not that he's playing poorly he's definitely not doing a single thing to take away from what they're trying to do offensively and i think that as he's gotten healthier over the years over the weeks i should say you're starting to see a better version of justin herbert every time we get to sunday but that's not a top five mvp candidate this is just a really good quarterback making a bad offense function all right that was awesome. I like it. Add a little spice to the plant your flag. Uh, thank you to everyone watching on FanDuel TV. Of course, for more, check us out on Spotify. Check out the Ringer NFL channel on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. 